Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, for our second breakaway session on day two of the 50th ASA conference, and we are excited uh, to kick off the session with uh, a presentation on enhancing aggregate reserving techniques through clustering-based segmentation. Thanks, Lester. Well, traditional aggregate reserving techniques assume that each data triangle used is composed of homogeneous group of claims, which is often a practical challenge due to management and reporting requirements. Today, our presentation will propose a new framework and methodology to these challenges or to address these challenges using machine learning. Mm. And of course, the uh, general rules apply. Questions afterwards, hands up. You can also uh, follow us via the app if you'd like to post a question through that platform. So a round of applause as we welcome onto stage Stefan Murray. Hello, hello. Yep. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, and um, yeah, so just, uh, just to clarify, I guess, um, yeah, aggre aggregate reserving is maybe not a common term. Um, so it just refers to triangles. So triangle reserving, reserving processes. Okay. So just to cover what we're going to do, um, just, I'm just going to introduce myself and um, just give a bit of context for the angle I'm coming from. Um, and introduce the topics, um, <clears throat> introduce the paper. Okay, so this, this is, a, is, a, is a presentation of, of a paper. And then um, we're going to introduce the concept of, cl of clustering-based segmentation. Okay, so um, after that, we'll just discuss the method, um, look at a testing framework, potential testing framework so you can use to, to see, to validate whether the, the, the clustering-based segmentation is better than alternatives or not. Um, and then, yeah, we'll just um, discuss a bit at the end and, and um, answer some questions. So, <clears throat> yeah, I just want to, yeah, so it's great to see many fam familiar faces. Um, and uh, I guess this is a room full of GI, the very technical GI, GI actories. Um, I guess if this, yeah, if something were, were to happen to this room, I'm not sure what will happen to the, to the market. That we'll, we'll see if anyone knows how to reserve. <clears throat> Okay, so just about me. So just to, just to so you guys know who you're talking to. Um, just to make it a bit more personal, I'm just a normal person. That's my family. Um, I'm a very proud dad and husband. So you can see how proud I'm. I'm just actually put them on, on a slide. Um, but um, yeah, so that's my little daughter. This um, and uh, yeah, so I I'm, um, uh, I work, I work for Dynamo Analytics. We're we're a consultancy, um, and we um, we we basically. Um, uh, we're all about process automation, and uh, my, my specific experience is in reserving mostly um, uh, to, uh, to build tools for, my, my, exp my background is basically building software for reserving. Okay, so yeah. And just also to mention, um, my, a lot of the context I have is uh, based abroad. Um, so um, this framework is also a bit meant for the UK markets and the Australian markets that we, we face a lot of, uh, I don't want to say their reserving is necessarily more complex than ours, um, but just I just want to say that, that that's, that's also where a lot of my problem analysis and, and context uh, comes from. That's, that's mostly, mostly my exposure. Okay, so <clears throat> um, this, this presentation is a paper enhancing reserving processes through clustering-based segmentation. Um, so just introduction to the concept. So for those, for those of you that have um, knowledge of reserving and you know some machine learning methods and you know all the challenges um, with normal triangle reserving, a summary of what this is is it's a framework that you can use to cluster claims, general insurance claims, to put them um, in homogeneous subgroups, so for a certain major class, you put them in homogeneous subgroups, and you use that as basis for your segmentation, as opposed to um, basis of traditional versus large split, or split by peril, or split by um, whatever. Okay, so that's just a broad, broad topic of uh, what this paper is about. A lot of thought um, went into this, um, and um, yeah, I'm really hoping someone, yeah, I'm, 
I already know of one company that's, that's, that's trying out this framework um, based in the UK. And um, yeah, I'm hoping this could open up um, a new way of, of segmenting, of, of segmentation. Cool. Um, at the end, I will also um, show some results um, after my initial testing. Okay. So just, I'm gonna go through some, some context and background, making sure that everyone is on the same page. Um, just to, just to, I just wanna get an audience, do an audience check. Just by show of hands, who here has general insurance reserving experience? Okay, that's about 50%, okay. And who, um, who has, um, who knows uh, what, what classification is in machine learning? Okay, and clustering, also, okay, same, same group. Um, and then just a check, um, who, who works in general insurance or short-term insurance? Okay, thanks, okay. Cool, so I can go in quite, quite depth, okay. Um, so, just, if we just take a step back and look at our current um, corporate actuarial environment, um, at the moment, there's a lot of transformation projects happening. We especially see this in, in, in the London market. Um, I guess they have big budgets for it as well. Um, but we also see it in Australia and in the Asian market as well, um, and now South Africa. Um, uh, everyone's talking about what does, it, uh, does a digital transformation pr project look like in my preserving or my pricing or, or whatever. Um, we also see that, that we're using more clever um, diagnostics to, to, to speed up our re reserve review. So we, 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 we create all these um, potential scoring methodologies um, for certain reserving methods, or we, we create these visual dashboards and Power BI or, or these sorts of things. Um, and um, then there's a, there's a big need throughout the market to speed up a reserve review turnaround. So, some of you might have experience with this, but, but we see that, um, that year end, we reach year end, um, there might be a lot of data problems, uh, manual, manual processes that, that need to take place. Uh, the key junior graduate who has done it recently might be on leave. Uh, it just takes longer than usual. Uh, who, um, so there's a, it, it, uh, just doing a reserve review at year end or at quarter end um, seems to just take a bit too long than what it should. Um, so um, there seems to be a need to improve this reserve review time uh, turnaround. And just with the requirements of things like IFRS 17 and these, we just we have to report more regularly as well. So it 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 keeps it keeps coming onto our teams. We some we, we need yeah. There's more and more pressure to do this faster. So then. Um, we also see, just chain in the market, there's all these advances in new reserving methods. So there's the individual claims methods, papers on that being published, uh, which no one has adopted yet almost. Um, and then there's, um, there's uh, I know Ron last year did a, did a, did a paper on, on, on bootstrapping the, the, the Cape Cod. Um, there's the Munich chain ladder, which is uh, now frequently, frequently used in Europe. Um, not so much used here, I believe. Um, and um, yeah, like the um, Big Thunder method, those, some of you might know that one. Um, yeah, so, and, then, um, and then another trend is everyone's trialing and testing to see what does machine learning in actual processes look like. So yeah, there's a lot of, uh, I think, uh, all the technical, technical papers for this year were, were these kind of um, ML in, in, in actual processes. It's very, very exciting. Okay, so then another piece of background that, that you have to know, that triangle reserving methodologies have limitations. And these are down to the assumptions, okay? So it, it assumes relatively homogenous groups. Um, and then, but as seen already in, in 1997, um, this is especially violated, this assumption is especially violated for long tail classes. So this was a finding in the London market. Um, and we also lose, just, just if we think just logically, if we group claims into buckets, into the buckets of the triangle, um, by cohort and by development uh, or financial year, um, something like that, um, we actually lose the claim level detail. Now those claim level details 
actually have a lot of information that could be useful for reserving. So we lose that information when we do our triangle reserving. So these are the limitations. Now, just a bit of a thought process. Is this maybe why um, the aggregate methods, for example, the basic chain letter, um, even though the assumptions are all supposed to hold, like you've got a, a big class, sufficient volume of data, is this maybe why it overstates or understates reserve frequent, frequently? There's a need for manual intervention to the patent calculations. Um, Reserving is maybe considered a bit of an art, not a science. That's a frequent phrase used. Um, and then is this also maybe why um, I've got a wide range of established methodologies of smoothing patterns, making very clever custom weightings to the, to the pattern calculations. Um, people are talking about um, algorithmic exclusions to, as, a, as a method, also a method of smoothing. Um, there seems to be always, an, there seems to always be a need to, 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 ju to, to adjust your BF, your chain letter, to the pat make adjustments to the patterns, make adjustments to the ILRs, etc. And then um, is this also maybe why um, it's a th very time-consuming process at um, reserve review periods. Okay, now, next step, step away from reserving. What is, um, so not away from reserving, but just another insurance concept that we need, you need to know about uh, if you don't know this. What is segmentation? So this is dividing an insurance portfolio into subgroups uh, for the goal of estimating a more precise subgroup. Okay, so more precise, more, estimating more precise loss reserves for each subgroup, sorry. Okay. And these subgroups we call segments. So the first level of segments is typically major class. So, and this is often constrained by your, your reporting, um, reporting requirements, after 17 or regulatory reporting requirements. You, so in other words, you can't put engineering business or engineering claims under motor, or you can't do that. So that's the first level of segmentation that we will call that major class. Whenever I'm referring to segmentation, um, I'm referring to a sub-level of segmentation throughout this, 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 um, the presentation of this paper. So it's, it's within major class, how do I how do I divide my major class into, into um, subgroups? Okay, that's, so that's typ the, 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 the typical techniques at the moment, uh, the popular techniques, is an attritional versus large split, or a split by peril, claim type, um, th those sorts, sorts of things, so those, are, those are popular ones. But the most, the most complex one I've seen is actually splitting first by entity, okay, class, that's sort of in line with with uh, um, the, the regulatory constraints um, for some purposes or whatever. Um, and then um, within a certain class, there might be a product level, um, so different products within the class, and then split by peril, then by sub-product and sub-peril. Okay, so that's the most complex one I've seen. Um, sometimes, uh, uh, a reserving actuary or a junior junior actuary working on in reserving, um, I, I, uh, you guys know what, what I'm referring to, um, sort of inherits this legacy class structure from what other people have done, um, and yeah, the, or maybe it's just a yeah, it's just an assumption that we always have to keep the same granularity. Um, yeah, so just, I just uh, just want to also highlight so. Um, another classic form of segmentation is, for example, the workers, comp workers' compensation clause um, to split by, 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 by claim type, by, by actual transaction or payments type as well, and then also do an additional on a large split. So that also cre creates a whole bunch of different, um, different segmentations. And even so, in w w one, one client um, that I've cons uh, done, done some, some consulting for in, in Australia, they... Um, so they also, um, so the, they, every every quarter end they have to choose between a, a few different kind of kinds of segmentation. So they they reserve on all bases, but then they may have to make a choice um, when they aggregate up the reserve afterwards. So it can get really 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 complex. So that's the context I'm also coming from. It and maintaining this segmentation. Um, so for example, if if your segmentation becomes too granular, or there's just a trend so that there's just less of a certain kind of claim, which means that a certain triangle just has no data in the most recent period, uh, the most recent financial period, then just 
you need to find find another pattern, make another assumption, do something else with it. So so that process of just taking these these triangles of of being too sparse and finding finding a more um, aggregate, uh, finding a parent aggregate class almost uh, that that process um, actually becomes really time consuming every every month end. So this can be yeah uh, tedious to maintain. Okay, so these are the kind of just market problems around segmentation. Then um, introducing clustering. So now we step away from from reserving and, 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 um, and insurance. Clustering is a classific classification te te technique that groups similar data points uh, together in a data set. Okay, that's very simply put. Um, we're just looking at similar data points. So what that would involve, for example, um, imagine, so just ignore, ignore this one for now. Um, imagine you, you see this. So. If you were to look at this and divide this into two groups which are similar, you, you, you might, you know, visually, with the eye, you can say, say these ones are probably quite similar and maybe these ones are quite similar. Um, if you have to do it, do it in three groups, I guess you can divide them like, like this if you want, or I don't know, maybe like, like that, like that, and like that. Um, um, there's many ways you can, you can group it into three groups, for example. But what, cl what, what clustering techniques, um, clustering algorithms do, is they they do this for for us. Um, so it's it inherently the method has a has a way of of optimizing um, creating these groups to ensure homogeneity or or achieve the the, the best level of homogeneity. Okay, so this is in two in two dimensional space. We've got a y and a x. Now this can be in n dimensions. So that in in that if it if you if you use if you use more than two variables, it becomes really hard to visualize. Um, and then you, you you have to kind of rely on the algorithm to do its thing. Um, right. So this is a um, so just a, just for also for context, clustering is a form of um, it's, it's, the, it's 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 a classic classification technique. So that's a, it's a field of machine learning. Um, and and just for interest, so clustering is unsupervised learning. So you, you give it input, it, it gives you output. Like there's no learning involved. Okay, it's always always going to give you the same thing as well. Right. So just uh, two two definitions that I need to introduce. So the centroid. So um, if you look at this diagram, if this represents a single cluster um, produced by a group by a clustering algorithm. The center point is, is what we call the centroid. Now this is just a central reference point, typically the mean or something like that. Um, and then the distance measure, so this is something that, um, you know, it's, it's a key metric that, that is used by the technique um, to figure out what, um, how far are, points, are, are certain points from, from each other. Okay, so for example, the k-means algorithm just uses Euclidean distance, so that's um, just, so for you, you guys that don't remember what that is, it's just a straight line in, in dimensional space. So it's just a, um, yeah, so just a, yeah, okay. Don't have to go into that in detail. Right, so then also just introducing the concept of feature engineering. So this is uh, widely used in, in, in GI, so anyone experienced with pricing probably knows what feature engineering is already. But just, uh, just for um, completeness sake, um, it's the process of selecting, creating, and transforming variables to create features, and these features are then more suitable for the modeling. Okay, so then the modeling then refers to um, to a machine learning model. Um, we do this already in in actuarial. It's not nothing new. It's just, for example, think of a GLM. Um, if you introduce take two variables, you introduce a, um, a, a an interaction, so a two-way sort of effect. That is a feature. A fee, it's, it's creating a, a, a something of two original variables. Just a bit of a diagram. So, um, so yeah, take raw data, you clean and transform, um, and those, that transformation process creates these features, and these features are then more suited for for whatever model you, you're using, whether this is a machine learning model or actuarial model, and then it gives you the, the result. So just a very broad definition. So introduction, um, we've now covered all the background. Um, 
context you need to understand this paper. Um, are there any questions up to this point? Is anything unclear? Just want to do a any yeah. Just want to do a quick one. Double check that I. Okay, great. Um, I'm assuming that's good news. Uh, so okay. Introducing the term clustering-based reserve segmentation. So this is simply. Let's use clustering. Let's try and use clustering to create our segments. Now, when I initially tried this, um, it's not a new idea. It's, not, it's like a lot of people have thought of this. Um, but so, um, yeah, it's my colleagues um, at, at Dynamo, we, we were chatting and we thought, let's do a research topic um, and let's try this one, okay? Um, so when I saw it started, it, it, it wasn't as simple as, as what it seems. Um, so you, you guys will, yeah. Um, I'm, throughout this, this whole, um, this whole um, session, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explain things as simple as possible. Um, when you read the paper, you'll see, if you read the paper, you'll see um, there are, um, yeah, there's a lot more depth to it and a lot more um, yeah, caveats and, and challenges around this process that, that I do describe in, in the paper. Okay, so, but my aim for this is a high level understanding, trying to make it as simple as possible. Now, just to, for discussion purposes, just to get our thinking going of how, from first principles, would you apply clustering for segmentation? So, first of all, what is, um, what is different to segmentation? So, why would clustering based segmentation be different to segmentation by claim size? So, for example, an attritional and a large split. Okay, um, or what is diff what is the difference? Okay, if we were to cluster um, by a feature called claim size, um, and we specified that the algorithm should only create two features, then we could achieve something similar to an attritional and a large split. Okay. That, that is somewhat similar, except that the, cluster, the clustering algorithm will actually choose the threshold for you. Right, so it's similar. So in that way, it's similar. But also, it seems like the clustering can be a lot more flexible because it can create multiple groups and you don't have to pick the thresholds. Well, you actually don't have control over, over the thresholds in that sense. Next, next question, food for thought. Now, if we think about it from first principles, if we do a attritional large split, is claim size actually a good reflection of a claim's development characteristic? So just pause on that. If we're doing reserving, we're mostly interested in the way claims develop over time, or after report, or even with a reporting delay. How do claims develop over time? Claim size could be a driver for that, but it doesn't directly describe the way a claim develops. A claim size, yeah, um, two, a claim, big claim and large claim can develop m roughly in the same way. Okay. <clears throat> so also, uh, just a little idea. So can you try and think of any feature so long? Um, so claim size could be a feature. Um, it, what other features could there possibly be that actually do describe a claim's development? Right. Um, okay, so just uh, these were the, the, the key research questions. Um, can, so obviously the, the stating the obvious, can clustering-based segmentation help us improve reserving accuracy? Can it help us reduce the turnaround, turnaround time for reserve review? And then key thing, without, with less intervention, by achieving less of intervention by the actuary every, at every reserve review, should we consider this as part of an actual reserve transformation project? Are there any other b uh, benefits into uh, um, uh, building a, a claims a clustering process? Okay, now introducing the framework. So after all the research and thought, uh, we came up with this framework. Well, and the, the, the paper pre presents this framework. So first start with separate, separating open and closed claims. Take closed claim, uh, uh, apply feature engineering to determine closed claim features for all, all closed claims only. Cluster these 
close claims together to, to create your clustering, to create your segmentation. And then for each closed claim cluster, go back to the original open claims and take each open claim and allocate it to a closed claims cluster. Triangulate, now we have our segments, reserve as normal. Okay, this is the framework. Um, now we will take each step, discuss why it's needed, um, why, for example, separate open and closed claims, um, how do you potentially allocate the open claims to the closed claims, um, what are the key things to look out, what are good features to consider. Right. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to this. Right, separating closed and open claims. Um, so this, is, this was one of the key challenges. Um, imagine you calculate a feature called total open time, so that, that um, report date up to when the claim was, was open, uh, was closed, in number of days, for example. If that is a feature that we want to use to cluster by, some, closed, some claims are, cl are open, some are closed. So either you need to not calculate that feature for all the open claims, because it can't be calculated, or you're going to introduce bias. For example, a very short um, se segment, well, uh, 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 claims which are typically very uh, short tail within your major class, could, be, could then, you, you, you might find that all the open claims will be allocated to that cluster. Does it make sense? So, that, that introduces bias. So, we, so, we, so, so if we use features that, that assume the, the, the information about the full, a claim's full development, we, um, we, have to sep we have to cluster the closed claims separately, or the, well, at least remove the open claims. So what, just for interest, um, what typically happens here um, in, in the field of machine learning is for whenever a feature can't be calculated, an average is assumed. So um, that is a common way of doing this in machine learning. However, assuming an average in this scenario is basically, basically doing your reserving for you. And, and it, it's, it's actually, the, the open claims are the, are the key, th key things that they mainly drive the reserve estimate. So these have to be allocated in the most optimal way. So naturally the framework recommends um, um, clustering them separately. So step two, take these closed claims um, and calculate features. So how do we take, so now the key thing to, to, to aim for is try and define features, not necessarily just claim size or, um, or the peril, like a, a categorical kind of variable uh, the, or the, or the um, degree of injury, uh, not only use just, just normal characteristics, but try and describe characteristics which actually describe a claims development pattern, okay? Um, so a lot of, when I did the li literature review, I found that a lot of, um, a lot of th there are papers and presentations, especially the Casualty Actual Society, they've presented a couple of papers on this, um, uh, where, where they take, a, for example, a workers' compensation class and use degree of injury to cluster by, and it actually, um, uh, it really helps them to, to, to figure out trends and it helps them for their pricing process mainly. But this is not really used in reserving yet, um, hasn't been really used in reserving yet, and, um, and yeah, but, and then, but then this, also this framework, I believe, is the first that introduces the concept of um, using actual claims transaction data for your feature engineering, in your feature engineering process. So if we just look at a claims characteristic, so the, imagine this is a timeline, a claim originates, it, it gets reported at a later date, and then eventually closed, okay? Now somewhere in between stuff happens, okay? Um, we have incurred it's got to incur development over time with, with, with the estimates of the size of the claim, and we have payments over time as well. Now, these are the key um, claim transactions that, that, that is proposed to be used in your claim feature calculations. So, um, back to, yeah, so what, so the, the paper suggests potentially to use 
uh, uh, features like reporting delay, so just the number of days um, since it was reported, um, or origin since report, that might be by unrating basis or by, um, or by, or by loss date. Um, so you can use potentially calculate Macaulay duration on your, on your actual movements, so incurred or case estimate movements. So that, that'll give you a nice estimate of, is my claim, does it have development towards the tail, or does it have, um, is it weighted towards the, towards the start? Um, total number of open days, just estimating the actual length it was open for. Um, and then um, getting a, some kind of measure for incurred development. Okay, so for example, um, taking the ultimate claim size, dividing it by the initial claim estimate at report date. So you can think of it like as all the chain link factors multiplied together. So that's, it gives a, you know, some, a multiplication factor if you just multiply it by the claim that you get to the ultimate. That sort of, that sort of factor you, you, can, you can also use as a feature. Um, so now implementing a clustering methodology. So this framework, um, so um, surprise, surprise, I'm an, um, I've got actual background. I'm no expert in machine learning. Um, so yeah, obviously this, so this, this, this paper introduces a, a, a non-prescriptive approach to the actual clustering. Um, but an example of how that could look like is you start by standardizing your data. Um, this involves for a certain variable, a column variable, um, subtracting the mean, dividing by the standard deviation so that each variable gets a standard normal distribution. Then applying principal, book, principal component analysis, if you have a lot of, um, a lot of features that, we, that you want to use, say it's 20 features or something like that, this is a way of de de uh, um, reducing the dimensionality of the data, um, but still um, re retaining all the describability. Um, and then applying the k-means algorithm. Uh, so this is an, an example. Um, you could use k-means. K-means is one of the simplest ones. It's a great place to start. It's very understandable. You can understand logic easily, um, and then you can use the ELBO method to determine optimal num the optimal num number of clusters um, for it to be statistically significant, homogenous groups. And you can look at other goodness, goodness of fit statistics. So this is an example of what a clustering process could look like. Um, so yes, so this is just on two features, the open time, number of months, and the case estimate size at report date. So this, this is just uh, an example. It's not necessarily a good reflection. This might not give you necessarily a very good reserve estimate, but uh, just for illustration purposes, so you'll see that a, a cluster was formed here. So three clusters were formed, um, and one was formed here in the middle, and one was formed here, here at the start. So this could be how the clustering process subdivides your claims into, into segments. Right, so allocating open claims to closed claims. So this framework proposes an algorithm for it. Um, so just for illustration purposes, so this is probably the most complex part to the, to the paper. Um, uh, but if you wanna try this out for yourself, it's best to go and read the paper and try and implement logic exactly as the paper describes. That's, I would say that's probably the best. Otherwise, you can email me uh, for questions. Um, right, so um, just if we look at our closed claim as earlier, so the claim, we know that this, this claim's full development. It's, it's, it's past, uh, it's in the past. We know that it's closed and we, okay. But now we have a given open claim uh, and it's been reported, but it's still open. Now we wanna take this claim and allocate it to see, or we wanna we want see if it, how similar is this claim for, to a given closed claim. If, if you had to do that from first principles, what would you do? So, so for example, what we can do is um, we can look, well, I guess we can look at like reporting delay and compare it against other closed claims reporting delay. This is all known at, at report date. So that's a very nice feature if you, if you don't wanna separate open, open and closed claims. Um, but we can look at these movements and take it as at when the claim is still open or, or the latest information available and we can, we can actually um, also compare that to the closed claim. So for example, if this claim is, still, is open for about 17 days, so we, we look at this claim, this closed claim, and we look at it when, as at when it was also open for only 17 days. Now we can sort of, now we can assume that this is, a, this is now comparable. The level of information uh, available is similar, 
So now these can be compared. And so you, so you just take the information available like here, and then now, now, the, now these ones, if we, if we look at characteristics of this piece and this piece, now we can potentially gauge a, um, a measure of similarity in claims. So the f what the algorithm involves is you take a single open claim, you compare it with the existing closed claims clusters, um, you, you uh, by, by, as I described in the previous slide, um, disposing of all the feature information that we, so, so you, 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 you compare it as at. So if a claim is open for 17 days, you compare it against all the closed claims, also as at when it was open for 17 days, for example. Um, and then you, we, we recalculate the features, um, or it might, these features might be different to the features we introduced in our closed claims clustering process. Um, there might be some more useful ones that we can now look at. We recalculate the features as at that, um, for all the, all the closed claims clusters. And then we redetermine the centroids as at the start. At, um, we, so for all the cl given claims, we, we've recalculated the features. Now we recollect, now, now the, uh, we need to redetermine the, the centroids. Um, so that's uh, just an algorithmic calculation. And then we, we, we t for the given open claim, we allocate it to the nearest centroid by looking at similarity. So it's basically like, on average, to, um, for the given open claim, is it, is it closer to cluster, uh, the average of cluster one, or the average of cluster two, the average of cluster three? Uh, and then you repeat for all the, for all the, um, for all the other uh, open claims. Now, you might think just to yourself, how, how, how can I do this in Excel? I don't think you can. Um, so, um, the suggested algorithm in the paper actually suggests that um, just to reduce the comp computational complexity, um, we, can, we can do this by operational time band. So what that involves is you, you look at your, your open claims, you divide it up into, into certain bands. Um, operational, operational time bands is a, um, is a, is a it's, it's, very, it's very common in, in, in the Australian market. Um, it's a different way of looking at claims development periods. Um, it's, it's sort of by percentiles based. Um, it has different advantages, but it's often used in individual claims projections. Um, and then, so, uh, so you, you, you band all your open claims uh, to reduce the, and then just you, you, you iterate the risk process only per band instead of per individual claim, first, first of all. And then it can also reduce the unwanted noise potentially introduced by the granularity of individual days. Um, okay, so then, Last step, now, you've, now we've reallocated the open claims to the closed claims clusters. We've got the full claims seg segments and we can just reserve as normal. Right, so just, um, yeah, so we've gone through all these steps. Um, yeah, I think that was, that was it. Um, we, we now need to validate whether this, 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 this framework actually works. How do we do that, okay? So, First of all, um, how do I know if, my, if the clustering process that, that, that was employed is actually a good one? Um, we can, we, well, if, if, we, if you use one, one, two, three features, you can just plot them by two dimensions or three dimensions or something like that and just look at them visually. Like, does it actually look like, you know, homogen homogeneous groups have been identified? Um, but if you've got more than three dimensions, this is really tricky. Um, so. But, you, but there's an algorithm called the, the TNSE algorithm. It's a, it's a mention of dimension, um, dimension re re reduction in order to be able to, to plot it. So this is, for example, um, this, this is like multiple dimensions, for example, like nine dimensions, um, but the data is transformed, so, so, so it, it becomes visualizable. Okay, so you can, yeah, you, you can, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of um, algorithms that, um, that you can look at. And then also just, uh, for those of you who, rem who remember the stats, uh, you can use the, at the you can look at the AIC values, the BIC values, and, and other scoring um, scoring measures for for clustering performance. But I guess the more interesting part is now how do we measure reserve accuracy? Okay, so um, so this this paper um, by Bologna and Richmond, um, Caesar and Ron, um, so they. In 2020, they, they made this, um, they, they wrote a paper um, 
that, that basically uh, highlights the need to have a, a framework to compare methods, to compare reserving methods and, and introduce a score. So they introduce terms like, um, well, they reference terms like the root mean square error, um, Avis E score and the CDR score. So I think the CDR score is from a um, Madison Wittrich paper um, in, in 2028. 20, um, so this is the claims development rate. No claims development, oh, something like that. But um, I would really recommend reading this paper. It's very insightful. It gives a lot of food for thought. Um, but now we need a framework that is able to compare alternative segmentation in a similar way. So it's not comparing reserving methods. So you can't employ this framework exactly as is. We need to come up with a new framework that's able to say, well, segmentation A is statistically better than segmentation B. Okay, the key challenges, finding a metric that's comparable over time first, first of all, and you know, ideally it should be a metric that's potentially independent of amount. So if there's a, if there's a, uh, a segment that, that has got really large claims, you kind of want it comparable against the segment with small claims. Um, it shouldn't, um, that shouldn't affect uh, whether it's a good segment segmentation or not. Um, but, but yeah, so those are the, the sort of uh, the wish list in a, in a metric. Um, and then um, another key challenge, just to look out for a caveat, um, is that every segment has a different claims distribution, which means, well, from stats understanding, we know that you can add up the mean, okay, but you can add up the variance. So if, if it's a metric that describes the variance, or that's a variance kind of metric, you can't add it up um, because, you, because, because, because these, cl these segments are not independent. Okay. So let's look at a, so the, 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 the paper produced, uh, proposes a framework. So the aim of the, uh, of, the fra of, the, of the testing framework is to see if clustering-based segmentation can improve uh, your reserving um, on, a, on a major class um, without the, actuary, the, the, the actuaries need to intervene and to make manual adjustments. So that's, the, that's a sort of um, a good uh, testing technique. So without intervention, is the, is the reserving result that, that was produced, is it, is it, um, is it better than, than alternatives or is it, um, uh, or is it better than, than just reserving on the aggregate class, for example? And you can just do this by backtesting, um, and then um, it proposes to use the root mean, root mean square error on the on the incremental lower triangle as a metric. Okay, so the idea is that you take take the take the sum lower the lower triangle of every segment, sum it up, and compare that against the aggregate. Or for alternative segment segmentation, maybe your legacy segmentation, also take the lower triangle of every um, of every segment, sum it up, and, and then also compare that. So, so you could have three comparisons against aggregate, against the alternative, alternative segmentation, or in a clustering-based segmentation. So just con con conclusion, just um, looking at our, our initial research questions and the, and the results of the paper. So um, can, can clustering-based segmentation improve reserving accuracy? Um, by definition, this uh, and what clustering does is it, by definition, introduces homogeneous subgroups. Okay, so we at, at least expected to address the homogeneity um, limitation or the, um, um, improve homogeneity, which should inherently improve your kind of like, like your basic methods. Um, and then, but just yeah, obviously as found in my testing, at least for a already already relatively homogeneous, homogeneous class, it might not improve reserving accuracy, which is natural, but um, just, to, just, just to note it. Um, and then um, it, you can expect that, that's what I mean. And then question two, can we improve the reserve turnaround? Now this is really hard to test. We're gonna have to look at timesheets over multiple reserve periods, and it's, it's difficult to test in practice. Um, we, yeah, so this is still to be validated. Um, and, but we do know that maintaining legacy class, class hierarchies could be very time consuming, as I illustrated at the, at the start of the talk. Um, and we also, well, this could also be a st one step closer to an auto reserve, but this won't, well, just a caveat, this won't be your auto reserve. <laughs> like, don't expect you to never, never have to intervene just by employing clustering based segmentation. This, this won't do that for you. Um, should we consider this as a part of 
as part of our actual tra um, reserve transformation projects. So in thinking about this, it's, um, the nice thing about this framework is it's backwards compatible against your, your, your current reserving process. You can just basically plug and play. So it's an easy place to start. You can still use your, triangle, your, your traditional methods as normal. It's just, it's, it could be a first step of introducing machine learning into your, your, your reserving process, um, but you just use the segmentation. So it's, it's, it could be a nice, easy step. Um, and then it also helps us to become used to dealing with individual claims data. So there are proven methods that are more accurate, that produce more accurate reserves, uh, individual claims um, methods, a lot of papers on it, uh, many different techniques, using very fancy neural nets and whatever. Now this could, be, could help us to, 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 to cure ourselves uh, um, to, to adopt these methods easier. And then, are there any other benefits? Absolutely, okay? Cluster analysis on claims can help you identify trends over time. Now this is proven in other papers, not even this framework. This has already been proven. It, it, it's, it's very, um, very it could be very insightful, helps you to, to easily spot patterns, okay? Now, for example, what you could do is for every cluster-based um, cluster segment that is created, take all the claims, fit a frequency and a severity distribution to it on each segment, and then look, just look at the frequency uh, dis uh, distribution variables uh, look at the, like, and compare them. So, um, so you, you can see, oh, this one is uh, more severe, this one is less severe. And then what, what you can also do is, 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 is create plots of these against the original claim features used. So then you can pick up, um, uh, oh, uh, this kind of feature, um, so there's a natural trend in this, in this kind of cluster. Um, and it can help you identify the, the trends in the data. And then just general learnings from pricing, like plotting the, way, plotting the stuff in, in, uh, in two-way plots and things like that. All these learnings can be applied here. And then just um, future developments. Um, where does this framework still need improvement? So then one of the next step, key things for, for me is to, is to work on a, on a process of allocating um, exposure back to, the, to these clusters, uh, clustered segments. So this is... Um, uh, taking the claim segments and applying the, the original policies back to them. Okay, so that allows us to use me um, methods such as the BA for the Cape Cod. Um, and then an algorithmic um, uh, potentially, so also feature engineering can be time consuming, unfortunately. Okay, um, the process of, of choosing what features are most applicable is, well, it, it's very insightful into, into, into the nature of your claims data, but it can be time consuming. You have to switch, switch on and off certain features and try it out, which ones produce better reserve estimates. Um, now, I think an, yeah, a, a key thing, a key nice, um, nice next step for this framework is, to, is, to, is for an algorithmic method to be developed that can run, run through all the different options um, of, of feature selections and then, and then basically, um, yeah, and, and help you identify what features to use. Um, and then, yeah, just generally, like, we don't know, we haven't done feature engineering on claims yet, so we have to establish best practices. So typically, is reporting delay good to look at for property? Or is it better, yeah, is it good to look at for, for, for motor? Or is it a useless feature? You know, best practices need, need to be established. And then we can just expand on our, on our clustering toolkit. So already, K-means is a quite a simple clustering algorithm. So GMM, the origi original GMM, not the new definition, after 17 definition, is, um, <laughs> um, is uh, Gaussian mixture models. Um, so the, this is an example of a, of a more clever uh, version of, of K-means, basically. So, that's, so that could be an, a next step to introduce. Um, now, just test results. So. Um, so for, for this, this, uh, this framework was tested on a, on a, on a data set, a uh, South African um, certain kind of class, very, very popular class written here, um, uh, 10,000 claims um, used, and then uh, just because of the, the limitation in number of claims, only, only two clusters could be fitted. Um, so 
So looking, so the, the features used here in this, in this, in this test study, um, closed claims clustering used, open time reporting the delay, et cetera, these ones. Um, you can look at, the, this, is, this is described more, more detail in the paper. Um, and then you can, um, and then the, the open claims use these features. And here's the root mean square error um, by method. So this is comparing uh, incurred, incurred, incurred projection, incurred chain ladder, uh, an auto chain ladder, um, on, a, on the aggregate class versus the clustered. So you, here you can see in this case, um, with this clustering, was able to optimize um, both the paid and the incurred projection without ma manual intervention. So the framework has potential. However, this, this class of business is, tr is traditionally a homogenous class, quite a stable class. Um, this next step is to test this on a, on a long tail class, something which is expect expected to be much more, well, much less homogenous. Um, yeah, and then, so this is also very interesting. So in cluster zero, here you can see the clustering automatically picked up for us that the, this cluster that was created had, had definitely had some form of um, salvage or something, something happening. It was able to identify the claims uh, automatically so that the, the pattern, the, the natural automatically cal calculated pattern was able to reflect this. So the, the black line is aggregate. So this wouldn't have been able to, it wouldn't have been able to calculate or, or spot that without clustering. So that's very interesting. Um, and the paid was just roughly the same. Okay. Um, right, so there, just to, now this is concluding. Um, so the initial testing suggests that that the clustering-based segmentation may be a valuable addition to your reserving process. That's the that's the conclusion, but it yeah um, I think um, generally um, it it needs adoption in practice and it needs practical testing to to actually validate this. Um, and then just now taking a bit of a step back, um, we've looked at um, many um, many technical topics now and yeah just. Um, where does this lie in your in your think about does this potentially lie in your in your reserve transformation roadmap? What are things what are other things to consider is just like, you know, um, you should still consider don't I wouldn't say first adopt this one. I would also I would I would say first invest in reserve review diagnostics. Uh, like diagnostic dashboards that help you um, identify A versus E patterns and things like that sooner. Um, consider uh, individual claims reserving and um, and then also, yeah, just work on your scoring methods um, to automatically help you pick which method is better. Is it the BF? Is it the, is it the chain letter? All that stuff. Yeah. So in just lastly, finishing off, I um, um, just want to thank uh, yeah, thank Lisa for reviewing the paper. She was an amazing help. And then also, also the, all the Dynamo support. Um, it was great working with everyone at Dynamo just to help me finish this, um, but we need volunteers in practice to actually um, help us test this, potentially provide data. So it's an open invitation. If anyone's keen to, to try out this flame framework, send me an email, let's chat, um, open invitation. I'm very keen to, 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 to take this further in it from a research perspective. Thanks, everyone. If there are any questions for Stefan, may you please raise your hand? Great. Good evening. Cool, thanks. Great paper. Um, this is a question on your opinion on why do you think short term insurance companies in general don't work more closely together between the pricing and the reserving teams? Because basically, what you describe now is sort of like a severity pricing thing. So basically, um, if you look at the whole infrastructure where there's enough data, you either have frequency and severity models, and where there's not enough data, you have like a Tweety model, a combined distribution, so just modeling the risk cost. So one part is like IBN R's, IBN ERs is more specific when you're talking to you on a development. So why do you think the pricing and reserving guys don't, so say on an accident, partial damage, where there's still repairing and needs to happen. So from my point of view, the severity should be, should be your ultimate goal because it's modeled on all closed, final developed claims. So the difference between who's standing now and final severity should actually be 
the party should be reserving for. Um, sorry, what's that last, last part? It's a bit... Um, um, like so, so to say just for a peril, yeah. you already know it has happened. So you pass the frequency model part. So now you're basically saying you expect a certain severity. So say for um, the severity that should come through now on the claim, you already have an expectancy what it should be at the end of the day. Yeah. So shouldn't you reserving be where you're standing now in terms of paid with a relation to where you expect to end up with? So your severity say 10,000, you already paid 2,000, so your reserving should be eight. Okay, so I guess that's two kind of questions. Um, so one is the pricing team and the, 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 the reserving team, my opinion on that, but then also like just how do you, uh, why, why is the, the, the kind of reserving so different, right? Um, so it's, um, uh, why, why, uh, yeah, you might have to, uh, have to help me out on, on that. Yeah, I think, I think the overall question is just, we already have a lot of these techniques. The severity model can be a linear on yeah. linear, linear model. Yeah. So yeah, but the main question is just, why is pricing reserving, except for the auditing purposes and everything, yeah. not work closely together, in your yeah. opinion? Yeah, so, okay, that's, that's the main question, cool. Okay, so, so I would say, um, I've got a, quite a personal opinion on it, I think, Firstly, um, I think us, we as actuaries um, and working for big corporate companies, we, we often mis make, make mistakes of creating silos, okay, first of all. I think the pricing and the reserving team have a lot to learn from each other, first of all. You can see, uh, clearly see in this paper, there's actually, it, it, it ties back to, um, trying to trying to spot these trends and things um, actually um, Reminded me so much of the of the of the pricing practices and, and and those kind of things. So you can literally learn from these from these two things. However, spotting trends and identifying and, and the methods are should still be a little bit different. I totally agree. I think we should learn more from each other and work closer together. Definitely, um, but. If we just look at claims reported or, and claims to which are already closed and stuff like that, that your data volumes are a lot less than your actual policy date, policy all their information. So typically the, 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 the claims volumes and data size is less. Um, so when you do trend analysis as well, like it's often of interest, so for underwriting practices, you've got a lot more control to, to put it into a lot of a lot smaller risk buckets because you, you, you can choose how many, how many um, underwriting factors and, and things you consider. So you, you've got a lot more control to zoom into very specific um, homogenous groups, whereas the reserving, you don't necessarily have the luxury of creating such granular groups. Um, and this framework is, is, is all about how can, how can clustering be used for segmentation but keeping traditional reserving methods, okay? The, the, the conversation about a different way of estimating reserves is a totally different topic. Um, so there are many cla individual, individual claims methods that, are, that use frequency and severity kind of characteristics and spot similarities and then develop each claim individually to aggregate reserves. That, those are, there are techniques like that. Um, and that is a bit more similar, I th I, what I expect, what, what I understand from your question, that is a bit more similar to what they do in, 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 in the pricing, on the pricing side. Happy? Yeah, perfect, thanks. Cool. Well done, uh, good paper. Um, my question would be, so I can see the potential applications for EDA, just understanding your claims better. My concern using it for reserving would be two, two things, so both kind of machine learning related. The one is interpretability, so what do those clusters actually uh, represent, and then repeatability. So if you have to then reuse a clustering algorithm next reserving exercise, you're not going to get the same clusters. And how do you kind of, how would you think about managing that? Mm. Cool. Um, so great question, especially the second one. The first one on, on interpretability. Um, clustering algorithms is not very, it's not really a black box. It's very easily to see what's happening. Okay. Um, it's very easy to visualize, and, and it's, it's, very, it's, it's a bit more transparent than I would say like neural nets. Okay? Um, so that's not a big concern of mine. Okay? Um, also, it's just a, your basis for segmentation, so there's not, no information lost. Um, however, the, the, the managing of, throughout reserve periods, what if every period you get a, like a claim moves from one cluster to another cluster, or one segment to another segment? Okay? Um, what I would do 
is first step in my analysis of change um, is what are the, is the impact of the clustering of the re recalculation of the clustering of the clustering. So this is not a it's actually not a not a new problem. Um, uh, it often happens that now you've got an aggregate segment that you want to split up into two by barrel or something um, because you because you you believe to be there to be some underlying trend. Um, same question. So, how do you compare that to the previous period? To the previous period, um, my suggestion would be to make it a step in your analysis of change. Um, see, okay, what's the what's the um, impact on reserving by step one, um, changing segmentation, something like that, um, and also just keeping track of over time where where certain claims were segmented. So, uh, cl uh, claims moving between clusters all the time could could imply that perhaps. My clustering is not really um, identifying homogeneity, and maybe my clustering isn't 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 fit for pur purpose for this line of business. So if it moves a lot, that's that's my that's my take on it. Cool. Thanks. Um, but your interpretability point um, that means that you should be able to qu quite clearly visualize what those two clusters look yes. like, yeah. and you need to be very convinced that you know why it's in this cluster, right? So yeah. Um, well, which is quite complicated I, I, I because you're already say, using four dimensions. You don't necessarily have to. Yeah. You don't necessarily have to to know why. So because afterwards you can actually plot the. Okay, so using principal principal component analysis. So those of you that know it, that actually, that that forces us to lose interpretability. However, that doesn't have to be in the clustering process. Okay, so you can still cluster plot the original the original claim features, and then it's very transparent. You can see what's happening. But as soon as you use, use PCA, then I would say yes. Then, then you, you, it becomes a bit of a black box. But um, um, our aim is reserve optimization. So, um, yeah. So I would say, yeah, it's, it's a trade-off. If you, if, if interpretability and um, seeing what's happening and 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 trends, mon uh, monitoring trends is very important to you, then you want interpretability. But if just a, a step closer to a better reserve is, is the main priority, then you don't have to have interpretability in that step. Um, because ultimately, you're just, you're just concerned, <coughs> okay, the claims are divided um, into, into groups, um, not, nothing got lost, I'm still gonna, 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 gonna have the same estimate at, at the end of the day. I'm still gonna, I'm just gonna improve my, my reserve estimate. Um, so that interpretability is not necessary depending on, on, on what you're using it for. Mm. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, we've run out of time. We've hit a, a, a hard clock. I'm sure Stefan would, wouldn't mind taking a question from you. Of, of course, you can also get in touch with him via the app. But Stefan, thank you so much. Really appreciate the discussion, a possible solution which will help the lives of general insurance actuaries here in the room.